Right. Hello, guys. Welcome back to our study of John. It's been a week this time, not two weeks. Pretty glad about that. So we're going to go through, we're starting John 5 today. But before that, I wanted to say that we've well, been with us for 20 of class, 20, 20 studies. I'm pretty happy about that. And um, today we're starting John 5. I think I already, I already said that, but sorry. Anyways, to start our study today, I'm going to ask an icebreaker. So we kind of get into the, into this conversation, into the setting, into what we're going to talk about today. And that's the question is basically, what do you guys think is the greatest sin? What is the greatest sin? I would say probably there's not really the greatest sin because all God sees all sin as equal. All right. No matter the level. All right. That's an answer. What about you, Evan? I mean, that's what I was kind of thinking of, but if you want like a, a firm answer to that, I would, just, I would imagine probably pride because pride often prevents you from uh, seeing your mistakes. In fact, you might put, try to put, protect your mistakes all right just keep going you know makes sense are you thinking kind of like the deadly the seven deadly sins by by the catholic yeah kind of were they the ones that came up with that i don't remember i don't know uh, i mean i mean if, if we want to go with uh the the ten commandments then that'd be different but. yeah yeah so okay pride is a big one which is probably why they put it as one of the seven uh but you guys would be surprised by, the, surprised by the answer, I think. We might not see this as a sin, actually, because, uh, well, we might see something else. We might see it as something else, but this is definitely a big one. Uh, Daryl is with us now, so that's good. And, uh, but I'm not going to answer that question right now. I just want you guys to think about it, you know? What do you guys think is the greatest sin? And obviously, Crystal said that there is no greatest sin. God sees all sin as equal which, you know, makes sense. Um, and then Evan said it's pride, which also kind of makes sense because pride can basically hinder your whole uh, relationship with God. Mm, but, well, let's see. Uh, hello, Daryl. Hey. So we just started. Uh, this is the icebreaker, and I just wanted to ask you a question. What do you think is the greatest sin? Mm, uh, greatest sin. All sins are equal. All sins are equal. All right. That's also what Crystal said. Um, interesting. All right. So, so far we have two against one. I'm not going to give my opinion because I already know the answer. But uh, cool. I'm ready to tussle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if we had Jose, maybe we could break the tie. I mean, not the tie, but the, you're, the, you're lost, Evan. But it's fine. Dang it. So, um, anyways, that was our icebreaker. It's, it, the icebreaker is just kind of like to get our conversation going and stuff. But now we're going to get into the text and then we're going to pray for this meeting, for this study. And so, if you guys want to go with me to John 5, we're going to look through 1 through 15 today. All right, so I'm gonna read it and then we'll, we'll, we'll pray. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Having five porches in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the staring of the staring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, "Do you want to be to be made well?" 
The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, Who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they, said, then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have, been, you have been made well, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment, for the opportunity to talk about you, to hear about you, to know about you. Uh, bless every single person that's here today. Thank you for, because you're the one that brings them here, God. You're the one that does the work and you're the one that's always working in our hearts. And bless whoever is watching as well, God, let this word be for them and for all of us, God, whoever it is, and that it does its purpose in our life, God. Help us to know you more. Help us to, to respect you, God, and to be able to listen to you, God, to believe in you, to know who you are and that you are God and that you, are, you should be the most important thing in our life to help us to change. And thank you so much for your word and for your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. All right, guys. Um, let's, get to the, let's get to the questions. So uh, who wants to read the first verse? John 5, 1. After this, there was a feast. Yeah, after this, there was a feast. There was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to, to Jerusalem. Right. So how many, uh, how, do you know, do you guys know how many feasts the Jews had? No, not really. Well, they, it, I mean, feast is, I was using the translation, but they had a lot of parties. They obviously have the um, Passover, right? That's probably one of the most important, but they also have other ones. And so they celebrate these, these feasts throughout the year. And as we just saw, uh, in John 3, Jesus was at Jerusalem because he wanted to part partake with the Passover. And that's the, where, that's the place to go because that's the place where they sacrifice the lamb for the feast. And then in John 4, we see that Jesus is coming back to Galilee after that. And he stops by Samaria and then Ghana, I mean, Cana, right? So it's funny because literally he was just back to Galilee so now in John 5, once again, he's back to Jerusalem because there's a, there's a feast. So where did Jesus go again? He went to Jerusalem, right? Because there's a feast. Uh, so obviously we can see that John here is not really m very interested in what's happening in Galilee. We will see more so what happens in Galilee in Luke, Mark, Matthew, because they make that emphasis. But here, John wants to talk about what God, God's mind, really. And that's why John is so important. That's why John is so awesome. And it's, it's different. It's, it's a gospel, but it's still different. It focuses on really God's mind, God's heart, right? So right now, we're getting to the best stuff. We're getting to back to Jerusalem. And here, so it's, it's probably taking a little bit of time. Uh, but they, the, the Jews do, do have a lot of feasts. They do have a lot of things that they, they celebrate for God and maybe for themselves. So that's just kind of like a little information there, information dump. Uh, but let's get to verse two. What does it say? Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate at pool, which is called in Hebrew. Bethesda having five porches. Bethesda, right? Bethesda. Yeah, you're good. Um, so what is there in Jerusalem? Sheep gate. A sheep gate. Uh, well, there's a pool that's by the sheep gate. 
which yeah and then there's a place which is called bethesda and so do you guys know what bethesda means yeah, I know it's a software company. Well, well yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I thought too. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, it's true, but that's like saying the rainbow is something else. Anyways. That's yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm making a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but what does Bethesda mean? I don't know. I mean, you guys yeah, can look it up on Google. Hey, look at up Google. It's gonna find a software. No. House of Mercy. What House were you gonna say, Grace. Crystal? Oh, I don't know either. But I know my Bible at the bottom even says it has like different translations with like Z's mm -hmm. or almost like something that says Besida, so, like kind of like the Spanish name in a bit. But I don't know if that helps with anything. Well, so I I looked into it a little bit, and it says that it means House of Mercy or House of Grace. But it could also be the opposite. It could be shame and disgrace. So that's an interesting, uh, you know. It's interesting you, because of what we're going to see, right? But for now, let's keep, let's keep that in mind. And this pool has five porches. Can you kind of picture that? What, what would like this place look like? Because for us in Florida, porches could mean something for what, what they mean, right? It could be like steps, like, kind of like a square. Yeah. Is it like five pillars? Like yeah. Columns? It's more so like that. It's more so like pillars. Uh, but there's, there, there's it's definitely a pool as we know it today. It's like, it's like square. A body of water, yeah. Mm -hmm basically more more so made by men than by anybody else right so anyways so that's that's all we can really get out, out of verse two uh let's go to verse three what does it say i'll read it because i know i haven't read one <laughs> all right you're good here, here a great number of disabled people used to lie the blind the lame the paralyzed um that's what my translation says i know it was a little different than your guys but it's yeah all right. you're good oh anyways guys uh this is crystal she's Hi. She's, a, she's a guest for today maybe she will stay for the rest of the study who knows um but yeah in this lay a great multitude of sick people blind lame paralyzed waiting for the moving of the water um so the questions here would be what type of people lived around this pool all the infirmed and afflicted. How many of them? Great multitude. A great a lot of them. And what were they waiting? Very, very many. Yeah. What were they? I think waiting? they were waiting for what? Savior, someone, uh, like a savior for someone to save them, or maybe they were just chilling around, just you know, like let me lay in my circumstances because they can't be accepting fate. Seems like. They were well, waiting. Well, I mean, in the in the in the verse itself, it says what they were waiting for. Or I, don't, I guess your version doesn't really say, does it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. In mine, it says waiting for the moving of the water. Which yeah. When I think of moving of the water, I think of like tides, and I don't think that applies to something that's equivalent of a swimming pool. Right. Uh, right. It doesn't make sense. What do you mean the pool is going to move? Um, yeah. But then, obviously, this, this question gets a little bit, uh, it makes more sense in the next uh, verse. Do you... Oh, I see why, because uh, that's funny. That's interesting. Anyways, I was, I was just reading, and it says that some versions have uh, this last, the last part of the verse taken off, as well as four. Um, yeah. so I, I can see why that. That's, it's, it's interesting. Um, wow. Maybe because they didn't like what they're, what it's going to say next. It's possible. Um, coat. So, well, who, who wants to read num uh, verse four? What does it say? For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoso, whosoever then 
Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever, whatsoever disease he had. Well, that's interesting. That's, that's super interesting because it's weird how they took that part off for your, for your version and some versions when there's the verse seven, but we'll get there eventually uh, because it wouldn't make sense otherwise. This has to be there. Um, yeah. Anyways. For, as you said, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the steering of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Um, so here, basically, we want to find out why did the water move, right? Because an angel went down. Because an angel went down. And so what happens when the water moves? People are removed of the diseases. People? What? People in like a, a plural sense? Yeah, who, who's, whosoever. Uh, no, wait. Yeah, whosoever, whosoever disease he had. Right. Yes. But so. is, it, is it in the singular form or the plural? Yeah, uh, uh, whosoever. So I imagine plural. So it's just anyone. Right. Well, mine says then whoever stepped in first. Yeah, it was. It, it, I don't like the word whosoever. It confuses me. <laughs> uh, so, so then it says whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whosoever disease he had. So that's interesting because is it like one person, like the first person that touches the water, or is it like a lot of people that do it right away? It sounds like first come, first serve. Right? That's, but, that's what I'm thinking. It's just one, like, and obviously we don't, I mean, this, the verse doesn't tell us how often it happens. It just says that at a certain time. So it could be once a day. It could be once a week or once a month, right? We don't even know. We don't really know. But it's, it's obviously something that's often because there's a lot of, pe a lot of sick people here gathering together, right? So they yeah. wouldn't do that unless, you know, it happened at least fairly often. Um, I mean, I mean, the only thing that comes to my mind is like, maybe it can only take so much basically disease and whatnot before it has to sort of recuperate itself. That's something yeah. I can think of. No, because it says right there that an angel has to come down to touch yeah. it. Yeah. To stir uh, it up. I don't know. Okay. Right. Um, but well... So right now, let's say it happens on, uh, let's say it happens every two days, right? And let's say, let's say only the first person gets healed, right? That's still pretty awesome. That's still pretty cool of whatever disease. That's crazy, right? It makes sense why so many people are here because it actually is happening. It may, like it, this is well known, right? So... The other question is, how many were, uh, oh, that's not the question. What type of sicknesses was, were, did, did it heal? Uh, is it lot, like, well, it doesn't necessarily, like, I mean, like my version doesn't say anything until like later on, but um, I think like one thing that is noted here, I'm trying to get some of it to go, get in my it looks like, I want to say paralyzation in this case. Well, like in the case of obviously the, yeah. this, the guy that we're going to talk about, he would have been yeah. healed from, yeah, from being paralyzed. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, obviously verse if, I mean, my, my version says that it made well, whatever the seas the person had, it made them well. Mm -hmm. So this was basically like, uh, a fountain of what do you, how do you call that the fountain, fountain of, of youth life. the fountain oh, yeah. of youth the fountain of of fantasy because this like if it existed today you know people would probably pay give everything to be there if they're really you know sick mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting right so anyways this little this is important for what we're gonna see uh now there's verse five. What does it say? A certain man was there which had infirmity 
30 and eight years. 38 years. <laughs> um, what, what was this guy? Wait, actually. Oh, man. He was probably old. So think about this. This person had a what? Had a sickness for 38 years? That's, that's a long time. Yeah, it's like physical mental weakness. That's what, the, that's what it means. Old age. So, so, I mean, we're on, this verse doesn't really tell us what he has. So we're just yeah. guessing. He could be, he could have whatever. Yeah, um, he, it, it just basically says he, something was wrong with him and he had it for 30 and, and eight years. Yeah. And one, one would think, bro, why don't you just go into the pool? <laughs> Makes you heal. <laughs> uh, but let's read verse six. What does it say? When Jesus saw him, <laughs> all right one at a time <laughs> never seen so many people jump on this yeah <laughs> all right I go. Wow. when jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time he said to him do you want to be made well right so first of all the first the first question i'm going to ask is how did jesus see this man He saw him lying there, right? Yeah, you see him lying there. Right? Uh, so what can we... And then it says that and knew that he had already he already had been in that condition a long time. Here's where we can uh, diminish... Uh, what do you say? Limit? No. I forget the word. Here's where we can really know. We can guess Determined. what his symptoms, what his sickness is right? Because Jesus has seen him lay down. And then it says that he's been in this position for a long time, right? So what is most likely his sickness? Definitely weakness. That's something that can't make him walk. Yeah. Something that makes him lay there. And he had this for, for, for a long time, in this condition for a long time. And so Jesus said to him, what did he say to him? Do you want to get well? Do you want to be made well? Yeah. yeah. And he has the power to heal. So, and then what, is, what does verse 8 say? Jesus saith unto him, rise, take up thy bed. No, 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 oh, sorry, sorry. Verse 7, my bad. That's okay. Yeah. The impotent man answered him, sir I, have no ma I, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step is down before me. Right. So basically saying, I want to be healed. But nobody helps me. I, 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 nobody can, nobody can help me, and I, I can't help myself. I, I can't get there in time. Yeah. So he didn't have help. What did he need? He needs someone to pick him up. You needed somebody to help him. Um, so what did Jesus do in verse eight? Then Jesus said to him, "Get up, pick up your mat, and walk." Right. We learned this. We learned this last class. Uh, I mean, last study. What with what authority did Jesus speak to the man? Absolute was basically the summary. Right? Assertiveness, I guess you could say. Right? Like knowing he had the power, but he wanted to make sure that the invalid man was on the same page as him. Like almost like a question, like, "Do you know who I am?" In a way, um, and well, really, yeah, kind of equal authority. Just, Using the the authority he has as, as as obviously son of God, as obviously Jesus, um, he's gonna say to the man, 
when what he what we learned in the last class was basically what Jesus says happens. It is and will be. There's no in between. He's not gonna. His word is not gonna. He's never gonna be wrong. Uh, he, everything that he says happens basically. So, yeah, just do as I do. He gave him that command, and he he had to. Uh, he was healed because of that, obviously. So, now verse nine. What 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 does it say? And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Just like Jesus said, right? He stood up, he walked, he took his, he took his mat and he walked. And that was, yeah, that's, I mean, that's it. There's no, there's no, did that happen? You know, is that going to work? No, it, it happens. And on what day did this happen? Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. And this is going to be important for next class more so. I mean, for next study more so because uh, Jesus is going to make emphasis on this and about the Jews. But not for now, right? But just keep that in mind. Um, so verse 10, what happens after he just leaves? The, Jew, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Why do they say this? Wait, I guess because he's doing work, like carrying the bed. Where, where, do the, where, do we, where can we find that, Daryl? Um, cause, uh, because uh, if I actually go back into the Ten Commandments, you actually find that. I was doing yeah. work on the seventh day. But the Jews don't like to work on Sabbath day. So that's probably what they meant. Yeah. Well, it's not that they don't like working. It's that they don't, they don't yeah. want to make God upset. Yeah, they have to keep the Sabbath day holy, basically. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure, like, what's, the, what's so interesting about carrying your bed, considering so, it was a mat, supposedly. Well, that's, yeah. a good, that's, a good, that's a good uh statement because i can give you the answer <laughs> well the bible can um if you if you guys want to go with me to jeremiah jeremiah 17 jeremiah 17 21 if anyone if any of you want wants to read it that's fine Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Continue. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hollow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they obey. Do you want to continue? Like uh, no, that's good. I mean, basically it's just... Um, here, Jeremiah is helping us know God's heart on the Sabbath, right? Because he wants it to be kept holy. He wants it to keep, to be, you know, he wants, well, more so than anything, he just wants them to be obedient to, to him, right? So he's telling them, be, don't work. So if you're thinking, of, if we're thinking about the Pharisees right now, they're thinking about this. We don't want to make God upset. And because of all the things that has happened to our country, to our nation, because of our disobedience, we we're kind of like, in a way, they're kind of making people do what God wants them to do, because otherwise they're going to be punished. So that's why the Pharisees are so um, kind of like sell us with this, right? They want to they want to keep the law, and they want people to keep the law. Does that make they, sense? They're being a slightly tyrannical, right? Yeah, but the, but they well, I, I try okay. to say that they they're doing it with a good heart, but <laughs> yeah, they're doing it for for good intentions, but, but they're it's not still, it's like, <laughs> they're, overbearing. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so that's it, basically the reason why they're asking this guy. You know, why are you carrying something when it's the Sabbath? You're not supposed to do that. So so, so they saw him carrying his bed as basically he's carrying a, a burden out of his house. Basically, yeah, or right? he's, he's doing, doing work. he's working basically. Yeah. Um, so, 
but just kind of like to uh, emphasize, what were they worried about? That was, that was worried about him breaking the law. Yeah, they didn't want him. Yeah. That's interesting, right? And we're going to talk about this later, but I don't know, maybe they're, maybe what they're doing is not bad. Maybe that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Right, but we'll we'll see. Yes, but it, but it wasn't like physical work, you know. I don't know how. I don't know what the bed looked back then, you know, because I know that you, you, you know, uh, you can't, you pick up the bed right now. If you really work, you're picking up the bed. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, and we do it all every day. We could be inside. <laughs> On Saturday, like I, I work on Saturday. <laughs> I, I'd love to see if he had like an actual bed. It's just like, it's just like stand up and pick up your bed, and he just like bench presses the bed. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Uh, anyways, yeah. So we're gonna talk about this about the, the Pharisees, a little bit about about a little bit today, but more so next week. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's it's pretty good. Um, so verse eleven. What does it say? Uh, for John, let's go back to John 5, verse 11. Um, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Right? So what is he saying? He's basically telling them what happened. Right? So he made, made me well. He said, pick up my yeah. bed, walk. So I walked. And, and, he, and he told me to, to, to take up my bed. And I, you know, yeah. Well, he said he, you know, and that the person that made me well, I don't really know who he is, but he made me well and he told me to do that. So I'm doing it. Right. Was he lying? Nope. No, he wasn't lying. He was just, you know, telling them the truth. I was healed and I just followed whatever he said. Right. Which we're going to, we're going to, this is, it's going to be an interesting conversation. At least I hope it is. Uh, but just, just know that, right. Verse two, verse 12, what does it say? I guess I'll read. I'll read this one. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Right. So what are the Jews asking him? Who, like, who gave you authority? Right. Who? Yeah. Why, why, <laughs> were, why did they ask him this? They're what? probably waiting for a ripple. They were looking for, they were shocked by that wave right. on the pool. Right. right. No, no, no. Probably. They, they were probably, they were like, it's, they, it's they wanted to know who this person was. They wanted yeah, to know who the person that, that told them because they're basically, they're probably thinking, who is telling the people to go against the law? Who is telling people to do what is not lawful in the Sabbath? Because that person needs to die probably. <laughs> and and to, probably. I mean, to, a, to an extent, <laughs> right? Because... Yeah, they, it's yeah. like uh, we're, we're the we're it's kind of like we're the caps and we're supposed to be according <laughs> the law, right. but this guy is telling us that nah, he's making the people go against what we're supposed to do. He's telling the people to go against God, basically. That's what they're thinking, and this pe this person is 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 damaging our whole uh, everything. <laughs> so, so we need to we need to go to the source. We need to find out. But then, what happens in thirteen? What does it say? The man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. So did the man know who Jesus was? Not really. Yeah, no idea. <laughs> I mean, that guy healed me, but I have no idea who he is. <laughs> like, he helped me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So we're picking up the pieces. We're, we're picking up the bread and uh, we're seeing where it leads. So... And obviously Jesus had withdrawn. He, he did it. He wasn't gonna. He wasn't gonna know. There's a lot of people there too. There's a multitude of people. And it's not like Jesus had this wide globe and wide robes that were like Clorox clean. No, he, his clothes were just like everybody else, and he was just like everybody else. He wasn't like he wasn't too. blonde, blue eye. No, he he was just as everybody was. I mean, he was just a normal person there. So obviously he's not going to be distinct, at least not for this man. 
So uh, what does verse 14 say? Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse, worse thing come unto thee. So was Jesus looking for him? Yes. Right, because it's, I mean, for me, it says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. It kind of implies that he was looking for him because he found him. Um, why was he looking for him? Wanted to tell him that um, you were well. Sin no more. Right. He wanted to warn him, warn him, right? This is, right. This is a warning. Does that not sound like a warning? Yeah. Yeah, it's a warning. And so the question here, this is where I want you guys to really think. This is where like, because I thought about this a lot, a lot before, but after when, when I was trying, when I was preparing for the study, this really made me think, how did this man sin? We just read basically the whole story. And so the question here is, how did this man sin? What was his sin? What, why is Jesus saying, you have been made well? Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Is it not believing or laziness? Like, right. Laziness, why laziness? It? Oh, laziness? I say because, like, you know, God really knew all, well, Jesus in this case knew all along, like, he had the power to heal him. And in a way, too, he always so was carrying the mat, which is kind of a burden and a baggage, which was a sin in itself carrying on the Sabbath. So maybe in the past it happened and that's why it caught up to men, which caused him paralyzation. If we're going to be analytical well, about yeah. it. I mean, you're, <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, at first I was thinking like, you know, why are we, why did, uh, are we thinking he sinned? But I was thinking as reading these passages and I was like, well, he came to fight. If he, if he said, um, was it this, uh, you are made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. If he sinned, if this was just a general warning, mm -hmm. why didn't he just say it when he first healed him? So I, right. now I'm trying to think of like, well, what exactly. did he do? And, and besides, and he just to... looked for him again, right? Because yeah. he could have, yeah, you're right. He could have said this the first time if, if it was something else. But he clearly did something that was not right something that can be they, they'll, well yeah. we only have the interaction with like the fair was it the pharisees we said yeah yeah so there's some this is probably something he said to the pharisees that he shouldn't have said you know so that's the, that's the thing you know that's where because the, the when i always read this i always thought it was because of that i always thought it was because it was something in their interaction with in, in his interaction with the pharisees with the jews but then when i really looked in I realized that that's not the case. It was something, there was something else. And it's very subtle. The, the, the passage is very subtle on what it is, but it makes so much sense in the end, right? Unless if it's something having to do with the temple. Mm -mm. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> the answer was already said, but uh, what about, what do you, what do you, so Evan, what do you think? It's because what, what in, if you say the interaction, what in their interaction would be counted as sin? Good question. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you think about that. Daryl, what do you think? I was thinking about because because how the guy, he might not be a believer of, of, of Jesus, or he, he might be just doesn't have to worry. He just probably doesn't know the word. So when Jesus told him, don't sin no more, maybe maybe that's what he meant about that. Because it doesn't really tell you his, the guy's backstory. So no. I'm, I'm just, just kind of like guessing that maybe don't sin no more, keep the right path. God, but since you know who Jesus is, you continue that. Well, let's think about this, right? This man has been par paralyzed for 38 years, right? 
And suddenly a person appears that asks him if he wants to mate well and is able to follow through with what he's saying in that he can heal him. And his whole life is changed by this person. Right? Right. But then we see his, his, his outlook, his outlook on that. Right. So what is the sin? Uh, it was, is it kind of like, uh, I don't have a good word to describe this, like flippancy, kind of like ingratitude. I, I'm not sure. It's, I mean, really, Crystal said it best. This person did not believe. His sin was not believing. Oh. And, like, I don't know, like, maybe it doesn't make sense to you. Does it make sense to you guys? Yeah. Because you can tell in the second part, he was able to identify who Jesus was. So he probably knew of Jesus, but the interaction probably happened so fast that it didn't fully process until the second time he saw like who the actual person was. Because it says he knew who he was in the second time, the second meeting. The second um, meeting? Yeah, yeah. So if you look at the first time, he didn't really know who Jesus was. But the second time he met they like met together and Jesus confronted him. He knew who Jesus was. So it kind of makes you think, no, did I he have, we're, I don't see that part. She's talking oh. about verse 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse 15, like the second part. Oh, because, because Jesus told them. Yeah. But um, I mean like his miss itself, like yeah. his identification. Before, before he didn't, we're talking about yeah. before he, yeah. Mm -hmm. Before he's like, who's Jesus? <laughs> yeah. I mean, somebody healed me, but I don't know who Jesus is. Yeah, and that that's impactful because, as I was saying, this person was paralyzed for thirty eight years, and a person comes in your life and changes your whole world in a second, mm -hmm. and you just you just oh okay sure whatever. <laughs> that's basically his 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 reaction to it. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I, do you guys see it any other way? <laughs> Because I don't. I, I mean, I think when I said flip it, that was actually pretty accurate with how you described it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the, I, I always thought it was because he blamed Jesus by he was carrying uh, the, the thing. That's why I thought he was, he was sinning. That's why I thought, you know, Jesus was mad at him because he blamed Jesus. But that's not really, that's not the case. He wasn't lying. He was telling the truth. He was healed and he just followed the order. So I finally realized this week that it was actually that he doesn't have faith. He doesn't believe in Jesus. He doesn't believe in him. And, um, and obviously we're still in verse 14 and it says, uh, see, you haven't been made well. Sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. This is an interesting statement. <laughs> lest the worst thing come upon you. Why is that interesting? Because so, what's worse than being paralyzed for 38 years? <laughs> going to hell. Really? What honestly, did you say? Going to hell. Because I mean, like, that's kind of what he's like saying. Something worse may happen to you. Like, he's kind of warning him in a way. Like, like, uh, be a believer, you know, with me, you find life. Of course, it's not in context here. Right. Saying something worse. And we kind of have that pre-existing um, idea in our head for believers. Yeah. What were we going to say, Evan? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> oh, my Sorry. gosh. That's fine. Give me one second, guys. Probably wasn't important anyways. What was that again? No. Nothing. Wait, come back and say it again. Nothing. Well, yeah, basically, what's worse than being paralyzed for 38 years? It's being damned for, the, for eternity. So that's, that's what Jesus is saying. If you don't, basically, Jesus is saying, if you don't believe in me, it's not going to be pretty. Because... Obviously, it's not it's not any it's not an easy thing to be paralyzed for thirty eight years, but it's definitely not going to be any easier to be them for eternity, right? 
And that's what basically Jesus is, is warning him. And he's being, he's being true to the fact. He's not walking around the fact. He's not saying, well, you know, maybe, no. Yeah, like, yeah, so, guys, you really shouldn't do that. If you keep doing this, something evidently is going to happen in your life that's going to be much worse than that. And there's no, there's no way around it, right? Anyways, uh, verse 15, <laughs> how did this story end? What does it say? And departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. So he was no longer some guy that helped him. He was Jesus that made him whole. Right. But you guys, how do you guys take this? All right. So the man, after he heard Jesus, he went and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. What do you guys think? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, both, uh, because the Pharisees were looking for him. Right. <laughs> so did this, the quite, I mean, Obviously, his, his sin was not believing. Did he still believe now? I mean, does he believe now? But honestly, like... Because let's, let's think about this. The way that, obviously, the Pharisees, the Jews, presented themselves to the man, right? Uh, they weren't happy about it. They weren't glad to see him carry this. And probably especially after he told them that it was some guy. And he, they probably had the demeanor of, like, where is this guy? Because we, we want trouble. We are looking, we, are, we want trouble. And I'm sure this is the way they, they were looking at it. So do you think it's a good idea for this man to go back to them and tell him and tell them that it was Jesus who made him well? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, it's not a good thing. So did this man believe or not? I'd say no, uh, assuming that he's not telling all Jews. No, because he he wants, where, what are, where is he looking for? What is he looking for? Is he looking for the glory of God or for the glory of man? Is he worried about how the Jews are going to see him or how Jesus is going to see him? He's worried about the Jews because it's like, if if he was worried about Jesus, then he'd try to keep him safe, basically. Exactly. Like, there's no doubt about it. This man didn't believe. He didn't care. Especially even after Jesus warned him, he completely disregarded it. And he said, oh, that's Jesus. Okay, now I know where he is, who he is. I'm just going to tell so that I can be, so that my name can be cleared with the Jews. Yeah, I, I, I suppose this is where my confusion sometimes in, it comes in because it said he told the Jews, so speaking Jews in general, but it's actually saying the Jews that asked him yeah. specifically. And so that, I mean, I don't know if it hits you hard, but it hits me really hard. Jesus just changed your life. He changed your life. But that didn't, that didn't mean nothing to you. <laughs> there was a verse I think my, uh, my dad mentioned to me. It was like, like, um, it was like recognize, recognize God in all things or something like that. And at this point in time, he's not doing that. And so that would definitely make people angry. It's like, I just helped you. And now you're just turning your back on me. Eh, I can't do anything for you, <laughs> you know? Nobody. He even warned him. Yeah, he it's, it's warned, another thing. That's what makes this do, even worse because exactly. he warned him, and he, he still came, did it. He came personally to him and said, "Don't do, don't do it. You don't keep sinning, or something worse is gonna happen." And he just do that. He just went and do that. That's like that's the thing about this story that always gets me is the fact that it happens right after the warning. It's like a slap to the face. <laughs> it's like, wow. 
What a guy. <laughs> so what I also what find it funny is, according to uh, verse 14, Jesus didn't even mention his n- name. And then the guy was like, I know who that guy is. He's Jesus. I'm going to tell people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a different, yeah, obviously. It's a completely different scenario. Like, kind of like the, um, the, the guy that was demon possessed had like a legion of them. And he's just like, I want to follow you. I want to, and I want to do everything for you because this is awesome. And, you know, but this guy wasn't like that. He's just like, I don't care who you are. <laughs> I don't care if you heal me. I care it's about what the Jews think that- about me another day in bethesda apparently (laughs) i mean and it's crazy it's crazy yeah it makes you kind of think if he's doing it for popularity because he's surrounded by people who were like him so it's kind of like he's the healed one he's like look at me but let me just tell you this but maybe this will give me more fame because i'm bringing more harm to someone else i mean no it's, it's really it's really just he wants to clear his name with the jews and that's, yeah. that's basically what it comes down to. He was he was he was clearly seen as working as carrying this uh, mm-hmm. in the Sabbath, and he doesn't want this image to stay with the Jews of him, because obviously the Jews hold most of the power in this area, in Jerusalem. So if he wants to live there and he wants to be in their good graces, obviously I'm gonna go back to them and tell them who told me because I don't want to be in trouble with them. I want to be clear. My name needs to be cleared and now that i walk <laughs> you know right i mean that's an that's an addition but basically the other thing is it can be it makes sense right one of us one of us <laughs> so sad right sad and um so here's where we get into the section now that we um study the whole thing right is where we're going to talk about two, sometimes it's different things that we talk about, but this is kind of like the, the thing that I felt God has spoken to me in this time the most. And that's why I feel like this is a hard message for a lot of people. It's, it's hard on me as well, but I feel like it's necessary for all of us to hear it. And so we're, we're going to start basically just with the questions, you know, once again, the question is, what is the greatest sin? Basically going is, I was going to say going going back after God helped you, but I think it's like a little bit more than that. It's so. it's more than that, yeah. Um, if you guys, if we, you know, you guys read the story, you know, you guys know what happened. Um, and really, the the greatest sin is not believing. It's not one of the seven deadly sins. It's not, you know. It's, I say, is the greatest sin. I know God in the word says that uh, he takes all sin as equal, but this is, this is probably why it's not considered a sin. I mean, it's not a category there necessarily because unbelief is just not, it's not something that can be forgiven because to, you need to believe in God to be forgiven. First of all, I mean, what is it? One of our previous, um, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go on that. Don't worry. Um, no, it's, it's like what we talk about darkness hides. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, okay. And that's where we can see that this is the greatest sin. And obviously the question that follows is why is this the greatest sin, right? Before we go into any ver- verses or anything, I want to hear you guys' opinions. Why would this, I mean, I'm obviously just right now talking on my own, you know, my own opinion, right? I haven't really followed it through with the, with the word, but I want you to be a conversation. What do you guys think this would be uh, considered something really bad? Um, you know, what do you guys think? No, nobody? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for someone to say something because I, I talk too much. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can talk, Evan, you're good. You sure about that? <laughs> I mean, don't take an hour. <laughs> okay, then I can't talk. <laughs> uh. <laughs> no. Um, well, it's. I mean, what we were saying is like, you know, after you see the truth, you should try to change your ways because now you see how f- re- things are. But if you turn back, even after 
seeing the truth and like what what hope is there really for you it's like you know you you're not ignorant anymore so you should do something to with that information that you've gotten but even if you go back to ignorance even after you saw how things are what hope is there for you you know so anybody else wants to bring something else in the table no um, kind of reminds me of the old testament story of um the family and the wife when god took them out of the city and was like don't look behind and the wife looked behind and turned to stone or something salt. Like, salt. yes so it kind of reminds me of that he kind of like he knows that someone healed him and he knows something is greater because God gave him warning, but yet you still return to your old ways and it's going to catch up in this I case. Mean, honestly, you're walking away from this city, like probably a good, a pretty big city. And I don't yeah. know when you start hearing explosions and people screaming, probably, I don't know. True. And you're thinking, Oh, <laughs> right. And he told me not to look back, but I'm still going to do it. Right. It's very <laughs> evident. It's very clear. You, sh- you, and but that's a good example though. That's a pretty good example. I mean, um, the way I can back up with this with the scripture, really, it's everywhere. <laughs> it really is everywhere. But one of the best is John three, as as Evan said, we talked about this. And John three, eighteen and nineteen are good enough just to understand that. Uh, anybody want? If you want to read it, that's fine. Uh, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. 19. And this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. All right. So, I mean, that, I mean, that just, just with that verse, mm-hmm not believing is the greatest uh, mistake. I don't know if it would be correct to say it's a sin because it really is just like, there's no going, it's almost like there's no going back. (laughs) Kind of like with the woman with the salt and stuff like that. It's because there's going to be consequences to your action. Obviously God could, could forgive you, right? God could forgive you if you come back to him because you believe now. But however, if he told you something that you shouldn't do and you do it anyways, there's going to be repercussions. There's going to be problems. Something's going to happen. And it's probably not going to be pretty. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I guess that would be an atheist person. They don't believe and know about them, but they don't want to believe. Uh, it, it's more like, um, it's, it's like, um, what is it? My dad talks about them a lot. P- Christians are, are like, um, you know, we're supposed to be living immoral lives, but they go and do something bad, but they go, oh, God will forgive me. It's like, yeah, but then you just do it again and again and again. And you, you know, it really, it really is more actually, although both things can, could come into this situation, it really is more like, uh, well, like Crystal said, in the sense of this woman, that they were told not to look back. Like God basically made sure to tell them, don't do it, right? And they didn't believe him. They didn't follow through with that. Uh, But however, we can also see it as, you know, as the other ones. Um, Because if an atheist doesn't believe and just doesn't believe until the end, well, something worse is going to happen to him. If, uh, If a Christian, as you say, Evan... Um, they don't, they disregard God, they disrespect him, they don't, they're not obedient to him, then obviously something worse is going to happen to them as well. Because God is very clear with all of us. He is, he is very clear. I mean, at least for myself, I can say that for certain. And this word is also for me. It's not just for you guys, it's for me. And we, we haven't even gotten into the word yet. <laughs> but basically, if you guys also want to go to um, John 16, really, if we, if John is all about this almost. It's, it's kind of crazy the way that we've been studying John. We've seen this over and over again about faith and how important it is. Um, 
and how powerful it can be as well. But John 16, 8 through 9, what does it say? And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of, and of judgment of sin because they do not be, they believe not on me. So here, obviously, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, right? And when he comes, it says that he will uh, convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And it's interesting that to convict the world of sin, he uses unbelief. They do not believe in me. He's not, he's not using they have pride or they have anger or they have lust. He's using they do not believe in me. And that's kind of like the main thing. Like God can forgive anything, but not believing, it's something completely different. Uh, anyways, two more verses, and I think we, we can get this point started. Uh, if you guys want to go to Second of Kings, if we, I mean, I've, honestly, like the Old Testament is really good about <laughs> seeing stories of belief and, um, well, actually the whole Bible, never mind. <laughs> belief and unbelief is everywhere. Uh, and we can see like the things that could bring about in our lives and the things that it can keep us, keep us away from as well. So Second of Kings. Uh, 17. Fourteen through fifteen. You want to do it, Crystal? Uh, you can do this time. <laughs> okay, fine. <clears throat> Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the necks of their fathers that did not believe in the actually, Lord. Actually, actually, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, my bad. Um, you can start from thirteen through fifteen. Okay, up one. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, "Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes." according to all that the law which I commanded your father commanded your fathers and which I sent you by my servants the prophets notwithstanding they would not hear but harden their necks like to the neck neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God and they rejected their statutes and and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he had testified against them and they followed vanity and became vain. And when after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them, they should, they should not do like them. So I don't, I don't like your version. <laughs> First of all, it's too <laughs> ye and it's a little bit old, uh, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not that it's bad. It's just, it's hard to understand. Yeah, I know, um, like notwithstanding is all one word. I hate that. Uh, but I just want to kind of like reiterate the things that you say in a, in a way that's more uh, actual, I mean, more understandable, I guess. But basically is here God is telling, is telling them, um, why are you being like your fathers, your fathers in the desert that didn't believe in me, that had to be kept there for 40 years because of their unbelief? Even though I was showing them all the signs, even though I was showing them the mana, I was showing them the pillar of light, the pillar of shadow by night and everything and all these things, but they still didn't believe. And now you today again are just like them and you're doing according to what they were doing. And now you're going against, you're going and following idols and you're following in all the, the things the nations around you are doing. And you think this is right before my eyes. This is not right before my eyes. Being ungrateful. Stop it. <laughs> so, and they rejected his statues and his covenants, you know, that they made with the fathers, his testimonies, and they rejected his servants, the prophets, and they followed the idols, became idolater, idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them. And concerning whom the Lord had charged them, he told them not to do like them, but yet they did it anyways. Right? 
and guess what? It's happening again. <laughs> it was happening in, in the time of Jesus, and it also happened in our time. Uh, the funny so thing, the, the funny you, thing about history is if you study history, like really study it, you realize nothing really changes. It all just goes around in a big circle. <laughs> yeah. And then lastly, lastly is Hebrews 7. I mean, Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, 7 through 15. I'll read it. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they did not... They and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Um, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a simple, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So here, the, the writer of Hebrews is being very clear with us, with all of us. What can unbelief cause in us? Rebellion. Rebellion. Departing from the living God. And what else? Uh, unrest. Mm. Well, they'll never enter my rest, and in a way, you kind of find rest in God. Right. Once you be a believer. Well, yeah, but really, more so than anything, it says, "Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin." Yeah. I, so I, when you're unbelieving, you also harden your heart to God. It's not just that you start you depart from Him; is that you your heart is hardened. And what happens when your heart is hardened? You just don't, it becomes a point where you're just like, I don't just get away from it. I don't want to hear it. Basically. You yeah. Sort of no. reject you, it. you depart from God and you close your, your ears, your eyes, you close yourself to it. You, you, you do the, the three monkeys thing. I do, so. <laughs> See, yeah. See no evil, hear no evil. Speak well. Speak. You're just gonna speak evil. <laughs> except it, except it yeah. becomes off. For it. See no good. Speak no good. Hear no good. So, this is what unbelief causes in a person. It's not that just that they start departing from God. It's that when they depart from God, their heart is hardened, mm -hmm. and makes them unable to turn back to Him because they just don't want to hear anymore. Is this not, isn't this what it's saying? Yeah. And it's saying, and obviously he didn't send with a good note, as we should. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. What is the rebellion? You guys know what the rebellion is? The rebellion? Yeah. Uh, I'm like, unless if you're referring to something. Oh, um, it's uh, verse eight follows with after rebelling during the time of testing in the desert. So is it like kind of in um, the things people do with like based on their actions or morality? I don't know. No, during the time no here God is talking about a specific event that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I was right. Um, uh, what did you say? No, I was. Just, you said the rebellion. I was like the rebe rebellion as in a noun. Are you referring to something? No, no, oh. it's, it's an event that happened. I, I'm, I was thinking Moses, but that's that's probably the most likely. Uh, yeah, it would like like when when Moses came down with the tablets and uh, the uh, the Israelites were like making idols and all that stuff. 
Oh yeah, no, that's that's the it's a, yeah. I went back and checked, and yeah, this is talking about once again when they were in the desert. It says uh, if you guys want to write it down for later or something. So in Psalm ninety five, it says, uh, "Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work for forty years. I was grieved with that generation." And said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they should not enter my rest. Oh, I guess we just read it in Hebrews. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> so <fun>. dumb. <laughs> oh, man. Anyways. <laughs> so. It's. There's. It's a, it's a hard topic, but I feel like it's necessary. Um, the Bible talks about it over and over again. And here Hebrews 3 is really being very clear with it. Unfaithfulness can lead to falling away. And it's, it's, it's a topic that we don't talk about enough in the church, I think. Um, because, but it's there. Which is funny because you apply that, to, you can also apply that to anything in life, you know? unfaithful to anything in life and you know something bad will definitely happen <laughs> obviously don't 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 forget about god's love but don't forget about his justice either um it's very clear if you're unfaithful to him doesn't mean that he has to be faithful to you because he's faithful to his word he never said he was going to be faithful to you he's faithful to his word and if you're unfaithful to his word then he doesn't have any need to be un- okay, faithful to you so here, of all the things that we just read, what is always the problem? Unbelief. Unbelief, not believing. Oh and, here's, and here's where it really gets to, you know, to the point of it. I feel like this is really what God told me, you know, in this, in this time is if he, tells, if he tells us something, it is for our own good. Listen to him are you not in this situation because you didn't listen to him? And if you fell into it, it is because you didn't believe him. You thought you could control it. You thought you could handle it, but you can't. Why would he warn you if he didn't know? God is a good father. Why can't we understand that? Why do we keep disrespecting him over and over again? Over and over again. Isn't it because we don't believe? Isn't it because we're not believing in him? I mean, and this, I don't know. I feel like this is speaking to somebody. It's definitely speaking to me <laughs> because I've, I, there's a lot of things that he's told me over and over again, and I just don't want to believe. And that's so, it's such a hard thing because why do we not believe him? And he's, he puts all the signs everywhere, all the time. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I told you not to do it. It's just, it's just like this, this man. Listen, I made you well. I helped you. I fixed you. Don't, don't, don't sin. Or unless something worse comes to you. And it doesn't have to be right away that you're going to be damned. It's not, it doesn't have to be right away that you're going to go to hell. But it could be little things that eventually can lead to bigger things if you continue in that. What I find, like, it's, I'm, not, I'm going to use this word, but I don't mean in a bad way. But I'm, what I find kind of annoying about this, what we're say, saying here is that I understand it because there have been many times when I've personally been trying to help people, but they still just do their own thing. I'm like, no, why are you doing that? Please don't do that. You know, or kind of like uh, in Willy Wonka, it's just like, oh, please don't do that. You're hurting yourself. <laughs> and it, it all, it, it all, it's all the same problem. I mm-hmm. think my path is better. I think my way is better. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that what I'm thinking is much better for me than what God is thinking. <laughs> and that's not the case. If one thing that I learned this last month and so is the fact that 
No, not even this month. This is this this whole year. God wants the best for you, even more so than what than you than you than what you want for yourself. And that's crazy to me. I still can't understand it to this day. I don't know how or why he wants. The, like it's how is it that somebody else wants something better for you than yourself? Mm-hmm. But that's God, and that's why. That's why he this he disciplines who he loves. That's in the Bible. It's not just like, oh, you're pretty and I'm gonna give you everything you want. It's I discipline whom I love. So if you're this if you're receiving discipline, then take the discipline. He wants to, you to be better. He wants you to be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So some people, funnily enough, when they're trying to help people, they think they're being um I don't know, like sympathetic or empathetic by letting people just continue on doing their own thing. But they also have, sometimes you have to realize that if you truly love somebody and you want them to do well in life, you have to tell them that that they're not doing something correct. And then, you know, that's going to cause people yell at you and go like, you're judging me or whatever. Obviously with, with all that, you, you do have to do it in a way where it's not seen um, negatively, not, not even like that. Like, This is where we go into our second point. (laughs) We don't want to be like the Jews. We don't want to be like the Pharisees. Obviously, we don't want to do, we don't want to sin before God. We want to believe. We want to walk the right path. But at the same time, that's your choice to make. Your choice and your choice alone. What I do in my life is my choice. What you do in your life is your choice. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you where to go or, or what, what person to marry with. That's not me. That's up to God. And that's up to you with God. I'm just telling you to listen to him, to be obedient to him when he tells you. Otherwise, right, I would just be like the, the Jews. Hey, are you, are, you, are you reading the Bible every morning? Are you praying every morning? Well, once again, that, that's kind of like, a, you know, what's in your heart? Are you trying to improve somebody or are you just trying to lord something over them, you know? No, but this is important because we're going to see this over and over again in the Bible. The Jews, the Pharisees, they were being hypocrites. They were being, they were being facetious or just, yeah. they were getting involved in something they weren't supposed to. You are going to have to tell people that they're wrong sometimes. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to tell people what they need to fix sometimes. But the right right time and the right place, you need to also be very careful on that. Because you also don't want to be a a stepping stone, not a slipping. A A what? Pedestal? No, you don't want to. You don't want to be a stone in the path of your brothers or sisters. But you don't want to trip them up. Yeah, you don't want to be the the reason why they're tripped up, because oh, well, that's going to be stum- on you. I think the Bible says stumbling block, right? A stumbling block. There you go. That's the word. Because what does Jesus say about that? It is better for a windmill to be hanged around your neck and then be thrown into the sea than for you to stumble a little one. And that's a big. That's a, that's like, <laughs> that's a big imagery. Right. It's kind of like the same thing with like if you keep sinning with your hands, cut off your hand so yeah. you don't stop sinning. And it's like being a believer can sometimes be a blessing, but a curse at the same time. But at the end of the day, it's more so a blessing because you're always going to help someone else through their process. But we always have to remember, like bouncing off what you said, to do it with love because that's the second greatest commandment, you know, to love one another. But and also, to reflect- right. But we, we can't get it twisted with how the love of today works because yeah. the love of today is like oh i just you know i'm nice to you and that's it but like when mm-hmm. we need to say something like jesus right he said hey i i i helped you don't sin anymore or something else worse is gonna come to you oh, now today we yeah. would think that what jesus don't why do you do that you're scaring him you're you're not letting him be his best person no there's moments where you are going to need to tell that to somebody if you really love them, if you really care for them. Which kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Sometimes if you really care about somebody, you, you need to, you need to show them how to correct themselves. I mean, it's something I always try to do with my friends, friend group. 
whenever somebody I say no criticism is just critiquing. So it's like, you know, you could tell someone what they're doing wrong and then maybe suggest a way to fix it because right. that way I know you're not just, you know, yelling at me, right. basically. What I really don't want you guys to do is, for example, something like you see somebody struggling with pornography or you see someone struggle with drugs or you see someone struggle with uh, alcohol and you're also struggling with it and then you tell them hey that's not good you shouldn't do that and you really mean it because you don't have any right to do that first of all because you're struggling with the same thing um if anything you you should use that for hey i'm in the same boat and let's pray about it or let's just help each other out through this let, let's but, work that work together exactly you're never should you should never judge if there's no place i mean even if there's a place our last resort is no not even we shouldn't judge um unless people are really like you saw it clear as day this person was healed or this this person was cured of cancer or somebody told them hey you shouldn't be with this girl or hey you shouldn't do these things or god told them somehow some way but they still did it in a way you should be like You know, don't do it. Um, I'll pull the trigger. And that's that's fair because both of you know it. Both of you understand the situation. And it's clear to both of you what happened. Uh, just as in this moment. So in that sense, yeah. But yeah, look, getting back into this this Pharisee talk. Um, this Pharisee talk. <laughs> this Pharisee talk. Um, what should we, what should be our worry, right? Now that we know these, what should be our worry? What did Jesus come to do? Die for our sins. Um, right. To make sure, put ourselves in check, make sure that we're walking on the right path. And I think it's so important to do that often too, because sometimes we don't even realize it. We have we tend to adapt to the world and pick up lukewarm tendencies. And it isn't until we're so deep into it, we're like, oh my gosh, like God, I left your side. Like I really need to come back home. So definitely unbelief is a big thing. Yeah. And I mean, I say this because obviously for, for us as believers, for people that believe in God, right? It's important for us not to get into unbelief not to allow unbelief to be in our lives because it could be detrimental for our, for our, for our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the main point of this. Um, but this is kind of like the second part in the sense of we need to know what, obviously we shouldn't be unbelievers, but what is our work? What, what, what is the, the things that we should do for unbelievers now? Right, for people that don't believe in God. What did Jesus come to do? Not even for unbelievers, for, for sinners. Because all of us were sinners at one point. And uh, sometimes we still sin. So it's not like, hey, we all need the grace of God. And what did Jesus come to do? And just, we all ended up on that. If you guys want to go to Luke 4. Luke 4. 18 through 21. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and re recovering of sight to the blind, to set the liberty, you know, liberty them that are bruised, to preach the, the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book and he gave it to, again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, Thy, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Right. So this is what Jesus came to do. And what should be our worry today then? If this is, if we, well, first of all, Jesus was, um, the first, it's kind of weird, but Jesus is our example of what it means to be a follower of God, what it means to be a disciple of God, what it means to be a Christian, 
although he, obviously we're following him, he was our example. And if this is what he came to do, then just as he did, we should also do. And this is what now, this should be our worry. So what are you here to do? To preach the gospel to the poor. So he, he has sent you to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is not just for Jesus. This is all for all of us. We are here to do the things that he has called us to do. Um, and it's interesting because what were the Pharisees worried about? They were, they were worried about the behavior of other people. They were not worried about whether they were in liberty, whether they could see, whether they felt safe, whether they were blind, whether they were paralytics. They were worried about their behavior. They didn't have empathy for the fellow man. Yeah. They were worried about something else. So this shouldn't be for us the same case. Our worries should be the kingdom of God and its righteousness. So what do we want? What does God want? What does he say that he wants? He says that I don't want sacrifice. I want mercy. Therefore, we should be merciful to our fellow brothers and sisters and even to sinners and believers alike and unbelievers because he wants mercy. And, and just think about this. Wasn't he merciful to you? in everything that you've done. So why can't we be the same for our fellow man? Because if you're not, you'd really, it, like we could, we could go around it all, the, like all over the place. There was a king and the king had, a, had a, somebody that owned him a lot of money and he forgave him that, but then he went to his servant and he asked everything that he had, and he beat him and put him in prison, even though his, his Lord was merciful to him. So obviously he came back before the Lord, and he had, he had to pay the consequences for not being merciful, just as he was merciful to him. So the, the death you owe God is greater than the death that anybody could ever own you. And that's, that's really, that's, that's it. You know, that's the worry. That's our worry. Our worry is for people to know God. Our worry is for people to understand his grace, his mercy, and that he's willing to forgive you. And regardless of whether they believe or not, that's up to them. You worry about your life. Worry about you being obedient to God. Worry about doing what he calls you to do. And while you do that, others will see it. Others will, will see the signs clear as day. And it's, it will be up to them to make that decision. But for us right now, it's to, to really understand that for ourselves and to be able to be the light that we're supposed to be. Because that's what, ca that's what God is calling us to do. Right? You should, you should definitely also learn how to forgive if anyone ever did anything bad to you, you know? Yeah. And that's, 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 that's the cool thing about being such, a, <laughs> such an awful person. <laughs> because the claim it was <laughs> no yeah really that's the good thing of being such an awful person because when you're awful you understand just how good god is and then you have no you have no there's nothing in you that can say i shouldn't be merciful to anybody else however a pharisee a person that's perfect that does everything right they don't need mercy therefore they're not gonna give mercy because everything they do, they do right. So there's no reason for them to feel like, I don't, why should I give my mercy to anybody when I've did and I've done everything that I'm supposed to do and I've done it right. People deserve mercy. Right. But if you, if you're a sinless person, I mean, I thought about this because in some situations I felt in, I felt very, very like in cloud eight cloud nine on how how good i felt about myself and in those moments 
I had no mercy for people. I had no reason to be merciful for them because I didn't need mercy. And that's how we work as human beings. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you should be a bad person. Absolutely not. (laughs) That's not the case. I'm just saying that's why God chose like the lowly. God chose the the sinners, the people that didn't deserve anything because they will understand more so his grace and his mercy and how to do it for somebody else. Um, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about the whole cloud nine stuff. Sometimes some days are good for me too, but whenever I get like that, I always have to slow down and remember that um, you, even if you are sinless or whatnot, you should still try, you need, your goal in life really should to br- be to bring up to people to your height and not push them down basically, yeah. you know? That's why I always help help out so many of my friends whenever they're annoying me with programming questions. I'm like, eh, yeah, I'm here to help. <laughs> you to know? be honest, like one of the best things to think about is remember where you came from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Remember where you came from, <laughs> right? Unless yeah. you unless you have to go back to that just to be able to remember, and it's not going to be pretty either. <laughs> so. Uh, it's always good to keep a good mindset about you. Um, that's why one of the proverbs is, well, no, that's, that wouldn't go with this that well. But yeah, you guys know what I mean. Anyways, any questions, any concerns, uh, comments? We're going to do the Lord's Prayer. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Told you I'd be abused. No, you're good. I, I sometimes <laughs> I just forget. I probably would have forgotten today. <laughs> um but yeah, guys, that was the study. That was John 5, 1 through 5, 15. I hope you guys learned uh, something. Um, and if you're doing something wrong or if you're not believing God for something um, that he has clearly told you over and over again what he's going to do, then I, I plead with you to reconsider, you know, to believe him, to hope in him. To trust in him whatever it is um because otherwise well we don't want to talk about that <laughs> uh but yeah so i'll close us in prayer and then we'll be dismissed <laughs> so lord thank you for this time thank you for this wonderful time where we got to know your word where we got to know you who you are, your character, your love for us, your mercy for us. Thank you for being so patient with us, God, and for um, loving us so much that you discipline us, even though we don't deserve any of it. We don't deserve any of your grace, any of your love. We don't deserve any, any of it, but you have clearly, freely given it to us, and we accept it, and we want to keep accepting it, God, so help us in our lives. Help us to keep trusting you, to keep loving you, to keep knowing you, God. Help us to do what you have called us to do, God. And help us not to have a hardened heart or a hardened head, God, but to follow follow you everywhere that you lead us to because you want the best for us. Even when we don't see it, even when we don't want it, you want the best for us. So help us to follow through with you, uh, with what you're asking us to do. And to have your peace, to have your rest, to have your love, God, help us not to be like uh, those that didn't listen to you, those that had not, did not believe you, God. Help us to understand that what you say happens, what you say goes. And if you make a warning, if you tell us some things because you know what's going to happen, you know better. You know that we're not going to be able to control it or to fix it you are so help us well you can fix all your all our problems but help us not to get to that point um help us not to fall away from you and thank you so much for everything our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. amen. All right, guys. It was a blast. Thank you for coming.